Thank you all. Welcome back to the next session. Um, it's wonderful that we're going to be talking about the future of the gender summits. And with me at this table, I have three people who know a lot about the past and the present and, and about the future. So Elizabeth Pollitzer is going to start speaking first. She's going to give an overview of everything that has happened so far. And she basically is the, the, the brain after, behind this whole operation. And she's a very modest person herself, so that's why I'm saying this with some emphasis. Without Elizabeth, we all wouldn't be sitting here today. We'd be doing lots of other things, but not focusing on gender equality in the world. So I think it's very pertinent that she's actually going to look back and look forward. Now, the next speaker is Professor Hesok Lee, who you've all met uh, today and yesterday and the day before. And also without her, we wouldn't be here today because she has organized this wonderful six gender summit and she will likely hopefully be involved in everything that's going to come and the third speaker um, is uh, the person who's going to organize the gender summit in japan miyoko watanabe um, and i'm going to write, read this out to make sure i'm saying it right she's the senior director of the japan science and technology agency and the director of the office for diversity and inclusive inclusion in japan and that gender summit is going to take place in 2017. So I think what, what I would really like to get out of this session, and so would Elizabeth and my two other colleagues, is a sense of focus for this whole global movement, a sense of um, a combined goal that we have, and I also think a sense of agency. Uh, I think we shouldn't underestimate the potential power of a huge group like this because there is so much combined expertise and so much brain power in all these gender summits. And I think it's time to step it up and to make sure that we become globally visible um, and we already are globally visible, but I think it can accelerate. There are a few things that I think have been done really well so far. The inclusion of gendered research and innovation into uh, the whole topic of gender equality, which has been particularly visible in this gender summit. Um, it's very clear that we have a very strong link with policy and government. It's not just researchers coming together here, but it's also people with a policy view and, and a particular potential of linking all these issues to the people who have the power and the money. We've always had lots of funding agencies and so I think that's wonderful, that's really good news. And we are becoming more and more global. We started as a relatively small Europe-centered group, that's what I remember from the first few years. But very quickly it spread, and it's still spreading. And that gives us enormous potential to also engage with other global networks, as I mentioned in my speech. But I think there are more global networks. There's a global network of funding agencies, for instance. They have come together, I think, three times now. I think we can engage them. Um, I think we can even talk to offices like UN Women, who are very focused on gender equality worldwide, but who so far have not really been working together with researchers and people who understand the evidence base behind these kind of policies. So those are just a few ideas that we can discuss after, we, uh, after I've given my colleagues the floor. So, again, it's wonderful to be here. I remember from the very early days of this movement, which is now six, seven years ago, a workshop with science leaders and, and sort of by magic, I was um, sent to this workshop by the director of my institute that I was then working at. And Landa was there and Kurt was there and, and Martina Schaudner was there. And Landa actually wasn't there the first time, it was just the science leaders and we decided we absolutely had no clue what we're talking of, we were talking about. And we asked Elizabeth, please bring in some people who know the evidence. That's when she got in troops like Landa and others and that really changed the, the outlook of what we were discussing and I'm sure it changed the impact and the, the, the potential for change because we then knew what we were talking about. And the first gender summit actually was the result of that GenSet project. And the rest is uh, history and present and future. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Elizabeth to take the floor and explain to us what you think we, you think we should be doing. Thank you very much, uh, Simone. Okay, so you have experienced the gender summit. It's not a conference, okay, it's a mission. 
and I think we have to continue and build this mission. And as the uh, minister said yesterday, you don't arrive at the future, you create the future. And I think we should create the future that we feel is right for science and for women and men in science. So the very brief history, first of all, our organization, Porsche, people ask me what it is, why is it called Porsche? At the, it was uh, created in 1997 by a group of women scientists at Imperial College. Imperial College is actually a university at the same level as Cambridge University in the UK. We were concerned about the talk of the way the gender equality was talked about. We were concerned about the fact that scientists themselves were not involved in those discussions. We didn't want to call ourselves women of four or something because there were already 72 organizations that were called women something. So we decided for the name Portia as a female character in Shakespeare's play. It's a character that has got very strong sense of self-worth feeling that she is equal to the men around her. And another very important reason is that there is a spider in Australia called Portia labiata. It's a very, very clever little spider. It's not pretty, but it's, a, it's, it's intelligent. And artificial intelligence uses it to model intelligent behavior. It's intelligent because like all spiders, it spins a web, but also specifically hunts for prey and hunts to confuse her prey until there's an opportunity to catch it. And so we thought it was a very good metaphor for us. We can stay small, agile, uh, work through collaborative networks, and look for opportunities where there's a real gains. So Simone already explained, and so our big opportunity to make change came in 2009, when we had a European project which was about gender in science, and we had this clever idea to bring about a panel of science leaders who have never before, it must be said, talked about gender in the same way that the many wonderful science leaders in this conference came bravely to talk about gender from a position that it wasn't the priority in their uh, research. And we have collected empirical evidence because we felt we're dealing with scientists. They don't want to be told. They have to make judgments themselves. And there was plenty of it. That was a very important thing. We also brought very important uh, gender scholars because uh, you know, leaders want to speak to leaders and trust the evidence. So that was very good. And after three months, uh, consensus was reached. A report was written. And a model emerged which basically says that you have to take an integrated action on gender in science. You just the policies, the practices, the knowledge, and how you develop the human capital. And all those themes have been discussed in this summit as well. So these are common issues for every region. The main conclusion with that as we, we, we saw is basically that the, the, the common assumption that science is gender neutral is actually an illusion. In fact, science has got more evidence for men than for women, and so there's a gender bias in knowledge, very important thing to keep on stressing to scientists, that impacts on research outcomes for women and men, and basically women get the short straw in this. So that was the idea for the first gender summit. The evidence was persuasive. Clearly, leaders could be persuaded. And, uh, we, and the way to go about it is to bring scientists, policymakers, gender scholars to meet. But of course, in order for them to be able to go beyond one event is we decided to have a, some set of principles. And there was a consultation. And out of this consultation came out manifesto it's got eight principles for Europe to move forward. So that was 2011. And our, this, this manifesto was signed by 5,500 scientists. In fact, in the first year of it going online, it was signed by 4,500 people, which means there is a really recognition of these issues and demand for action. Then we had a very important uh, task because the uh, European Commission was uh, setting up plans for the new framework program, which eventually was called Horizon 2020. So we persuaded with the help of Britta Thompson, who is actually present at this uh, conference. Britta, can you wave your hand? 
there we go. So she helped to persuade politicians within the European Parliament that that should be hosted in the European Parliament. And of course, parliamentarians don't care about excellence in science, they care how much science costs. So we wanted made to make sure that gender did not disappear from the proposal simply because the budget would be cut. Uh, so we, we have developed this A to Z guide for the politicians which talked about the benefits of taking gender actions and we produced this uh, uh, report called From Ideas to Markets, again to highlight the opportunities that come out from taking actions and from having a gender sensitive and gender responsive research. So Horizon 2020 did come about, it, uh, we, ha we, we had the first year of it, and gender was included as a criterion of success. This is the first time in the history of uh, European Union. We've been doing gender equality in European Union since 1957, but nothing changed in science. Here we have a three ways of measuring uh, ways of making improvements and what are the goals of the European Commission in this, which is increase the number of women in leading scientific roles, integrate gender dimension into research process, and promote gender as a cross-cutting issue that is not just for women, not just for health, but also for transport, environment, and so on. And there's not only action going from the top across the Europe, but also at national level and institutional level. So publishers have started recognizing that they have to do something. Research councils, such as Research Council Norway, has actually developed a new strategy, and the Lancet has changed the policy, and there's now training on gender bias introduced across quite a number of uh, uh, research council, certainly in, in the UK. Uh, you, your National Science Foundation came to two gender summits, like the idea, like the concept, and decided that they should introduce gender summit to North America, and have done so in collaboration with major research funding bodies in the region, and that is a very important thing to strengthen. For this for gender summit to exist and to move forward, it does need the ownership of a major science institutions. In this particular summit of America, there were six, 650 participants. We nearly got the same uh, uh, number here. Uh, it was uh, lasted three days, and truly, it could have gone for another three days. There was so much to say. So basically, what we are stressing is, this, that's why this is not a conference. This is a, uh, a mission because this is about looking at the evidence, getting this evidence, and improving this evidence, bringing policy makers, scientists, gender scholars, and other stakeholders, industry, and so on, to agree what actions have to be taken to make improvements, and then who should take those actions. In the same process, we are building the community of experts and practitioners, which we now have around 6,000, and of course, now we're going to add another 600 from this uh, summit. Uh, it's very important to have a regional expertise and also to have a kind of a global expertise. And in order to do this, we also have some kind of a guiding principles for us to keep on moving forward. Because there are things that we all share together, and I think that was obvious from the many talks, and there are also things that are very specific to different regions and that was also quite clear in particular from questions yesterday. So, but basically, we have to move in a collaborative and mutually supportive way. So that's where we are here now. We have moved from Europe, where things seemed quite relatively easy, to other regions. We are in North America. Uh, last April, we were in Africa. Uh, so Asia, uh, Asia Pacific, there's going to be a gender summit in North America in Mexico next year in April, and two days will be for North America and one day to find a framework to establish gender summit Latin America. Because I feel, I think it's going to be important that in every region people can discuss this issue in the language that they really are conf uh, familiar with and comfortable with, 
and not really through the language of, uh, of English. So, so this, uh, this is kind of the thinking behind where we're going. So basically, it's a global movement for lasting change through regional evidence, through regional consensus and actu actions, and by building communities of experts and practitioners. You can find all this information that we've been doing on our websites. We share it widely. We are very free with everything that is done and found. And so uh, after me, uh, Heisuk Lee will explain how she managed to bring this wonderful gender summit to being here. Thank you very much.